I am and I am your host for today. Today's topic on hot melt extrusion and its application in pharmaceutical industry is covered by Dr. Vijay Kulkarni, who is heading the business development team at Steer Life. Let me give a brief introduction about Dr. Vijay. Dr. Vijay is a master's in pharmacy from Bits Pilani and has a PhD from the Maharaja Sayajirao University, Vadodara. He is also a postdoctoral research scholar from the University of Mississippi and has over 18 years of experience in pharmaceutical research space. He has developed various products and processes using hot melt extrusion platform. Dr. Vijay was awarded the Rising Star in Formulation Development during FDD Conclave 2019 in Hyderabad for continuous manufacturing using twin screw processor. He has contributed to eight granted patents, 15 publications, and has done more than 50 presentations in pharmaceutical domain. We also have a QA session. You will find a QA tab at the bottom of your screens. Please drop in and ask your questions about today's topic. Dr. Vijay will answer them at the end of the webinar. Please also participate in the polling question at every break. We will have three such questions and we'll really appreciate if you can respond to each one of them. Without further ado, let's now go over to Vijay to commence today's webinar. Uh, thank you, uh, Vidya. Uh, thanks for the nice introduction. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning. Uh, based on the locations, I welcome all the participants for the today's webinar. The today's webinar topic is hot melt extrusion and its application in pharmaceutical industry. In the today's webinar, we are uh, will be seeing the basics about hot melt extrusions and how hot melt extrusion can be used in pharmaceutical industry. Uh, to begin with, uh, as a steer group, uh, we, we have uh, been able to cater many uh, industries, right from polymer, biopolymer, powder coating, uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, food processing, and even compounding of uh, uh, various construction materials. Uh, mostly, we will be looking about the pharmaceuticals application using hot melt extrusion process. Just to give some introduction about uh, the pharma uh, history in Steer, uh, the company was being started in '93, and uh, this is uh, close to around. Uh, 26 years, uh, 27 years, uh, we have been there into this hot melt extrusion space, and we have uh, been uh, uh, selling equipments and its parts since then. But in pharmaceutical industry, we started our first equipment sales in 2009 for an HIV uh, product manufacturing. From there, it's almost around uh, 12 years of the journey now. Last year, we have even uh, installed uh, a continuous uh, granulator at one of the large volume API manufacturers. Uh, this is a continuous uh, twin screw granulations, uh, which does a wet granulation process. Uh, Steer has a global footprint and the installations, what we have is, uh, we have four global offices. The headquarter is in India, Bangalore. Uh, we have uh, our uh, application lab and global office in uh, US, China, Japan. And uh, we also uh, do have an application center in these locations. Uh, when we move uh, towards, towards our topic, uh, let us understand a few things before we start. Now, when we see a uh, solubility enhancement, there are a lot of uh, uh, strategies which can be applied in the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, when we have uh, a solubility enhancement uh, for the liquid dosage forms, you use various uh, techniques. But when it comes to uh, solid oral dosage forms, solid dispersion is one of the major technique which has been there. Cyclotextin inclusion complex is there. Size reduction by micronization or nanonization can be also been there. But we would focus more on the solid dispersion. So when we say solid dispersion, it's, it's one of the API or more than uh, API, uh, more than one API is been dispersed into an inert polymeric matrix system or it can be a lipid. And the processing is been done either by using heat or a solvent. Let us understand a solid dispersion before we move ahead. Solid dispersions are of three different types. One is crystalline solid dispersion, where the matrix system or the polymer is amorphous. The drug which is dispersed inside is a crystalline. 
and that is why you could see on the picture is uh, there are drugs which has been uh, uh, distributed as a crystalline form. So when you do a DSC, you see a glass transition temperature of the polymer and the melting point of a crystalline API. The appearance would be opaque. Why crystalline solid dispersion is required? The application is you can use it for modified release formulations. Even solubility enhancement can be possible by uh, reducing the particle size to micro and nano suspension levels. Sometimes it can be also been used for taste masking. So this uh, crystalline solid dispersion is thermodynamically stable because API is in the crystalline form. But there are other two uh, solid dispersions also been possible, which is amorphous solid dispersion, where the polymeric phase and the drug both are being converted into an amorphous form. When you do a DSE of this, what you would see, there will be a two glass transition temperatures. The third category is amorphous solid solution. When we do an amorphous solid solution, so here it is also the same that there are two amorphous form, but the drug is completely visible inside the polymer. And that is why you would see one glass transition temperature. And the application here is mainly for solid, uh, solubility enhancement or dissolution enhancement or increasing the viability. Because of converting a crystalline material to an amorphous form, this system is thermodynamically unstable. So there are a lot of pharmaceutical variations which you can create so that the whole system is thermodynamically stable. Let us see about uh, HME applications. HME application can be API driven. So when I say API, so you are modifying some API properties or you are modify, or you are using some polymer system so that you alter the release. Solubility enhancement is one of the major applications of HME for mostly the BCS class two and BCS class four uh, APIs because we know 40% uh, of the API are poorly bioavailable. And that is why solubility enhancement is one of the way to enhance the viability. The others are modified release like delayed release formulations, sustained release or controlled release. Taste masking can be possible. And fourth is stabilizing the active. When I say stabilizing the active, uh, one of the best examples is uh, uh, stabilizing the flavors in, uh, in, a, in a matrix system. The other applications are mostly with respect to making a device or formulations. Like implants, which can be parental or it can be a dental implant, transdermal patches, fast dissolving films, and drug eluting stents. Uh, we have the first polling questions here. Uh, over to you, Vidya. Thank you, Vijay. Here is our first poll question. Please select your answer from the list of options displayed on your screen. What would be your preference for enhancing the solubility of API in oral solid dosage form? Spray drying, hot melt extrusion, micronization, nanonization, complexation, or inclusion? You have about 30 seconds to choose your answer. <laughs> All right, let's see the results. 4% say spray drying, 44% say hot melt extrusion, 45% say micronization or nanonization, 7% say complexation or inclusion. Also, if you have any questions on the ongoing webinar, please drop into the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and kindly ask your questions. Vijay will answer it at the end of this webinar. Over to you, Vijay. Uh, thank you, Vidya. So uh, based on the polling questions, what I understand is a uh, lot of participants or the pharmaceutical industry prefer hot melt extrusion. Uh, we also have seen uh, a micronization or nanonization techniques uh, for also celebrity enhancement. So there is a, a mixed opinion where uh, the pharmaceutical scientists uh, also believe uh, nanonization or uh, micronization can be also an approach for celebrity enhancement. Where in fact, uh, the micronization or nanonization can be even done by hot melt extrusion. 
So let's move further about hot melt extrusion. Let us understand hot melt extrusion. So what do you mean by hot melt extrusion? The word itself say hot melt and extrusion. So you are providing a heat to melt certain material and passing through an orifice. So when you say passing through an orifice, it's an extrusion process. What you see in the picture is a golden mass flowing down. So it's a molten uh, polymer, which has drug visible inside it. So what you need in a hot melt extrusion is a meltable material. In this melted material, the API is mixed and pumped through a die. And when it comes out, it's been cooled and shaped uh, as per the application what is required. But this material mixing takes under a controlled condition of temperature, shear, and pressure. So extruders, uh, there are two different types of extruders, single screw extruders and twin screw extruders. Uh, we can have this uh, discussion later on, uh, it's out of advantages and disadvantages, but twin screw has a lot of advantage over single screw. Generally, there are two screws which have been side by side, as you see in the picture below. This screw can be rotated either in co-rotating directions, both in the same directions, or it can be a counter-rotating. So both have advantage and disadvantages. So uh, when we have twin screw rotating each other, they have an ability to clean themselves. And they even have a work done on the material. Now let's understand what's the uh, benefits of using hot belt extrusion. So it's a solvent free process. When you compare this with the uh, spray drying process, this is a solvent free process. Overall, this is also a continuous process. And hot belt extrusion is a better mixer for a viscous material. And even there are certain literature which says the solid dispersion formed by hot melt extrusions are more stable in comparison to spray drying. Additionally, uh, we pharmaceutical scientists don't like drug to be exposed to high heat or because of the sensitivity of an API. In certain cases, yes, uh, there are uh, some case studies where we are able to process heat sensitive API also. Additionally, uh, the question also comes as, okay, you have an extruder, how this would be applicable in terms of uh, uh, commercial manufacturing, easy, easy clean over, cleaning or change over, what are the probabilities there? So we have a great experience and this processor can be easily clean. And uh, you can also enable the hot belt extruder with inline process PAT systems so that you can monitor all the parameters. So this can be even possible because being this a continuous system, you can continuously monitor the product quality. Moving to the next slide is uh, HME systems and how it has been classified. So generally, uh, hot mill extruders has been classified on the barrel diameter. The first instance comes as a barrel diameter because that is the one which decides what is the throughput capacity. So larger the diameter, higher the throughput capacity. Next is L by D ratio. So this is the length and the diameter ratio of the barrel. So in general, the pharmaceutical industry prefers an L by D of 40. It is not limited to 40. In certain cases, it can be less than 40. It can be more than 40. The other thing is a DO by DI. So when I say a DO by DI, it's more specific to the diameter. Uh, screw diameters or screw specifications. It's a ratio of outer diameter of the screw versus the inner diameter of the screw. So higher the number, the more is the output uh, performance capacity of the extruders. So additionally, uh, we, the HME can be also classified in terms of number of barrels uh, which you have. So in general, it can be eight or it can be more than eight. So sometimes we have even built an equipment with an L by D60 for special applications. Let us understand uh, an extruder system itself. So start with, you see a solid feeding system. This solid feeding system is been used to feed the blended material. It can be API and a polymer blended together, can be fed through a gravimetric or a volumetric feeder. And when you feed, the feeding can be either a star fed or a flood feeding. 
So star feeding and uh, flood feeding is based on the applications. But in general, star feeding is being preferred. The, now the material enters into the extruder, that is solid intake zones, and it proceeds further to the melting zones. So this entirely, the, uh, the bottom line is the processing sections. So as I said, it can be eight sections, it can be 10, so depending upon the application. So here, these barrels, every zone can be cooled or heated based on the application. Specifically for hot melt extrusion, you heat the barrels by heating, you're softening the polymer or melting the polymer, and then mixing this with an API. Finally, the material comes out of the die, and once it comes out of the die, you can cool by either using a chill roll or some other applications. It can be even air cooling can be possible, and you flake it or pelletize it. And what you get outside is uh, flakes or a pellet, uh, pellets. The other things uh, in the uh, commercial applications, so you generally record various in-control parameters, in-process control parameters. It is barrel temperature or the die temperature, screw speed, torque or the power consumption. This is because once you set the process during manufacturing, it has to run at the constant torque. What is the pressure? When I say pressure, it's a die pressure. And what is the feed rate? So feed rate can be monitored or it can be even adjusted based on the feeding system what we have. So if it's gravimetric feeder, so you can control the rate. If it is volumetric feeder, you are, you'll be able to only record the rates. Now this slide is very, very important to understand because this tells about the various uh, mixing actions which are been there. So in hot melt extruder, you have three different uh, mixing actions can be possible. One is shearing, second is kneading, third is stirring. And this can be possible by changing the different types of crew elements which are been available. So when you do a shearing, shearing can cause a heat generation uh, and then can be even a breakdown of the particles. Hence, it would lead to a formation of a dispersion. Kneading, there are various types of kneading can occur. Again, screw geometry plays an important role. Elongation, folding, twisting, and uh, compressing. This leads to wetting of the material because if the drug now has to get solubilized into the polymer, it has to get wetted. So kneading elements can make this wet. The third, we have stirring. So this stirring can cause homogeneous distributing, a distribution of the API. The side picture, what you see is uh, the differentiation between distributive mixing and dispersive mixing. If you have an initial mix, what happens? You special uh, elements, you can do a distributive mixing. When you say distributive mixing, homogeneous dis uh, distribution of the particle takes place, and thereby you get a content uniformity. Whereas a dispersive mixing, you are able to reduce the particle size. In hot melt extruder, both the things occur together, and finally what you get is a dispersed, well-distributed homogeneous mass. And that is why the twin screw is a versatile application, has a versatile application whenever you want to do a better mixing. Let us now understand few parts of the extruders and elements plays a very, very vital role in the processing. So selection of these elements is going to be very, very important. So extruders generally have two different types of uh, screw elements, broadly categorized as conveying elements and the mixing elements or kneading elements. Let us see about conveying elements. The one picture what you see is a screw element which is conveying uh, element. So we can identify or uh, we can make a choice of an element based on the pitch what we have. So the one what you see on the left hand side is uh, one element with X pitch. The one in the middle is again a one pitch element, but the pitch is smaller. For example, this left hand side can be a 20 pitch. The middle one can be a 10 pitch. So the pitch decides the conveying efficiency. Alternatively, if I'm going to be, uh, just a second. 
If I'm going to just break this element into half, what you get is this uh, half pitch element. So, uh, so this can give uh, a scientist an opportunity to adjust the screw, uh, screw length because when you put all the kneading blocks, finally you have to tie it up. So uh, the pitch can be very vital and you can, you can just close those pitches there. So uh, screw elements in the conveying, there are multiple screws which have been available. So uh, depending upon that the material what we have, uh, or flow property or the bulk density of the material, you can make a choice of the conveying elements. The one you see on the right hand side is, is the uh, a table. If I'm going to use a single fighted element, the free volume is going to be low, but the conveying efficiency is high. On the other side, if I'm going to use some shovel elements, it is going to be having a high free volume, but it has less conveying efficiency. So, Conveying is also important. Uh, generally, we don't give a lot of importance to the conveying, but we only say that okay, it is going to be just pushing the material, but having a right choice of conveying elements is very important. And there's a sequence of the conveying elements when you put into an extruder. Generally, you start with a high pitch and bring it to a low pitch before it goes to the mixing elements. Now let us see about uh, uh, various uh, kneading elements. This is the one which causes the mixing, that is distributive or dispersive effect. So that is why uh, selection of these elements uh, is very, very important. So if you make a wrong choice, you will end up degrading your API. Or if you, if you even impossible, if you make a wrong choice, you may not melt the polymer itself. So making the right choice of an element is very important. So one in the left hand chair table, what you have the element angles. The one on the top is a 45 degree angle and one in the bottom is 90 degree angle. Why do we say 45 and 90? Because you have a set of elements which have been arranged together and the element behind this is at a particular angle. In this case, when I say 45, this is at a 45 degree angle. And at the below, when I say the 90 degree angle, the first element and the second element, they are perpendicular to each other, they are 90 degrees. So 90 degree element has the highest mixing and shearing effect, but it has no conveying. So having this element is one of the mandatory requirement. Again, when I say uh, this is based on the application, but, um, 90 degree element is much required. 45 degree element has little bit of less mixing and shearing effect, but uh, it has a better conveying efficiency. When I say better conveying efficiency, it is not as equivalent to any conveying element. On the right hand side, you see one more table. So here we are able to understand the length of the element because if I have uh, a 90 degree or a 45 degree angle, but if I change the length of these elements, this is also going to cause a lot of effects on the processing. Let's take an example here. The one which is in the top is a larger length in comparison to the one in the below. So that you can see it from the picture, the length is on the smaller side. As the length is higher, you are able to see a lot of shearing effects, but mixing effect is less. The vice versa is true. When the length is shorter, you have more mixing effect and less shearing effect. So that's what it says. Higher length of kneading element can give you higher shearing and hence higher degree of dispersive mixing. So uh, this is a general view of an entire screw configuration uh, right from the start to the end. So this is just an example. It's not something uh, uh, for a, standard application where you can use it for all process. In general, you have an intake zone where the material falls and you use conveying elements over here. And then there will be a slight mixing element. You can keep it here so that you can just compress it and take it outside. Further, as you move down, so you come around AB2, 
which is the major mixing zone. So you keep the barrel at the higher temperature, you melt the polymer and do the homogeneous dispersive or distributive mixing together. And the material now moves further, it comes across a venting zone or a vacuum zone. The vacuum zone has been generally required because most of the polymers have some amount of moisture present. It can be 2% to 5% based on the polymer used. And when you heat this, it is going to be release of certain moisture there. So that moisture has to be taken out. You take it from this venting section. Finally, you pass the material to the die. At the end, there is a metering zone. This is just a, a video which says about how a twin screw process works. What you see in this process is that both the screws are rotating in the same directions. And as you say, they are shearing the material on the wall. And even the shearing is also occurring because of two screw rotating each other. So from one side, it moves and it passes the material to the next slide. This is just a, a, a video how a material moves inside the next scooter. And we say uh, this is a twin screw rotating in the, uh, the same direction. And the black side is the barrel. So inside this barrel, two screws are rotating. Now let us see uh, the, the sub, uh, sections when the screw rotates. You see uh, a picture here, the screw is rotating. And the one which has been marked now here, that there is a material transfer from one element to the next element. So here, the, there is a free material transfer. In the next, as the screw rotates further, there is a pressure being built up on the small volume of the material which is there inside here. So there is some built up pressure built up. As it moves further, there is a small pinch which occurs here. And this is where the highest pressure is being applied on this material. And this, irrespective of the DO by DI, can cause a lot of hazards. Specifically, pharmaceutical industry are much worried about generation of an impurity. So impurity doesn't generate only because of uh, the temperature. It can be even because of a mechanical energy. Let us see a few products which have been uh, already marketed. This is not an exhaustive list. So there are a lot of uh, new additions have been there. Just for an, uh, reference, there are a lot of products which have been manufactured by hot melt exclusion process. So uh, the application depends upon uh, what is being required. So you can see a grisofilvin uh, 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 product made by hot melt extrusion, specifically a crystalline dispersion. Uh, Anti-retroviral Norway or Keletra has been made by an amorphous solid dispersion. So there are various uh, products already available in the market. We have the second polling question over here. Uh, over to you, Vidya. Thank you, Vijay. Here is our uh, second polling question. Please select your answer from the list of options displayed on your screen. What are major problems you come across using hot melt extrusion technology? Right selection of polymer, right selection of API, polymer ratio, drug degradation, scale up, or all of the above. You have about 30 seconds. All right, three, two, and one. Let's see the results. 7% say right selection of polymer, 9% say right selection of API uh, polymer ratio, 9% say drug degradation, 9% say scale up, and 65% say all of the above. Also, if you have any questions on the ongoing webinar, please drop into the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screens and please ask your questions. Vijay will answer them at the end of today's webinar. Let's go back to Vijay to continue with the webinar. Yeah, so that was the uh, interesting uh, poll survey. Uh, many of the uh, participant or majority of the participant says all of them. I do agree because each one is very, very important. Uh, having uh, had this poll question, let us understand uh, in answering all those six. I'm just trying to cover in a short period of time how best I can uh, make the audience uh, know about this. 
Yes, selection of the right polymer is very, very critical. So uh, let us see what are the different types of polymers being used. So the one which are being highlighted are one which are been highly used, but it has been not limited. You can make a choice based on the application or the formulations what you are uh, developing. So generally, polymer have a glass transition temperature. In certain case, you may even see a melting temperature. And this understanding of a glass transition temperature or the melting temperature is very, very important. The reason being, you cannot select a, a polymer uh, which has very high uh, glass transition temperature or melting point because that can affect the uh, processing conditions on the API. Now let's see how you can make a right choice of a polymer. You should understand when you want to make a solid dispersion for enhancing the solubility, you need to make a choice of a polymer which is more aqua soluble. Or there are a lot of literature has been available from the polymer industry that what is the solubilization capacity of the polymer. Finally, the solubilization capacity depend upon what is an API you are used. So there are a lot of theoretical models currently available in understanding how or how much the solubility can be possible for a respective polymers for that particular API. But important thing to understand is to know what is an aqua solubility. Next is glass transition temperature. Yes, that's very, that's very important. In general, as a thumb rule, the uh, glass transition temperature has to be 50 degree above the storage temperatures. So that is very, very important. So you have to make a choice. Now, glass transition temperature generally are, or the glass, you have to select a polymer with a glass transition uh, temperature, which is less than the API melting point. More of the things which you need to understand is the polymer has to have a lower TG because the first the polymer will melt and the drug can get solubilized or miscibilized inside that molten polymer is one way. The second way is drug and polymer both melt together in the processing section. So melting is a prerequisite and that is why glass transition comes into a picture. So most of the uh, uh, scientists only restrict to these levels, but even we need to understand other parameters of the polymer. Whether, what is the hydrophilicity and lipophilicity balance of the uh, polymer? Because that is critical to solubilize your API. And you need to also see if there are any possibility of hydrogen bond forming in the process that will stabilize your solid dispersion. So that is why hydrogen bonding is also important. Temperature and chemical stability. Yes, because uh, at that particular temperature, there may be a chances of the polymer being degraded, especially the main chain or the side chain. Side chain is the one which degrades faster. Example is SPMC AS, where you would see acetate and succinate coming out. And this acetate succinate, when it comes out of the SPMC AS, can be again a detrimental effect on the API. Similarly, PVPVA, it's vinyl acetate. So there may be a chances of vinyl acetate being coming out. So you need to be processing the polymer well below their degradation temperatures. Choice of, again, the polymer uh, depends upon the formulation, as I said, whether you want a pH dependent release or a pH independent release. So, so there are certain polymers uh, where you can choose uh, from the uh, list. AS is again uh, enteric polymer, so it can give you a delayed release formulation. HPMC is an independent of pH, so you can make a choice. Combination of polymer is very, very important. In certain cases, one single polymer may not help you, but making a combination can really help you out. So that is why making the right combinations. Example is, we have seen literatures where SPMC AS and HPC can be used as a combination. So they can go complementary together. Plasticizer requirement, because if the uh, TG is very high and uh, the drug can degrade it at that TG, you can use a plasticizer so that you can bring down the uh, glass transition temperature of the polymer. 
Finally, it has to be non-toxic at the larger amount because in most of the solid dispersion cases by hot melt extrusion, you use a ratio of drug to polymer, which is one is to three or one is to four. So the larger quantity should not be toxic. Finally, it should be low hygroscopic because moment if it has a hygroscopicity, it may cause an instability in your product. We will see a few of the case studies based on how the selection was been done uh, during the case studies. And the next question is, how do you select the processing, <coughs> processing conditions? So there are four major processing conditions. One is ballot temperature. It is very, very critical because temperature conditions in the heat zone uh, will, will, will help you in understanding whether the drug degrades or not. So ballot temperature is critical. But when I say a barrel temperature, so this barrel temperature can give you some initiation or it can contribute in the initiation of the process. But the majority of the energy which comes out on melting of the polymer is not because of the barrel temperature, but it's more been coming from the mechanical energy, which has been because of the screw speed. So it is going to be a combination of barrel temperature and screw speed. Screw speed is a mechanical energy, barrel temperature is the thermal energy. So these two combinations can be sometimes exponentially very high to degrade the drug. So screw speed selection is going to be uh, the mechanical energy and screw speed also decides about what will be the residence time. Because you don't want to expose the drug to a higher heat for a longer period of time because you melt it, but you need to move the molten mass as quickly as possible out of the extruder because longer exposure to the heat may cause a degradation issues. Screw configuration. So there are n number of screw configuration possibilities in there, but there are, based on experience, you, you can make a choice of what screw element you can make a choice. Yes, in a screw configuration, there may be a combination of conveying elements, mixing elements, and conveying elements. So right choice of screw configuration is important. So you can make a screw configuration in a such a way that you can make the material stay longer period of time in the extruder. That means screw configuration can affect the residence time. Screw configuration can be also decide the distributive or dispersive mixing. Feed rate. Feed rate decides the throughput because larger quantity you feed, so larger will be the output. But if you put more amount of feed, it affects the specific mechanical energy because the total work done on the quantity of material has been defined by the feed rate. Let's move to the next is how a formulation scientist need to carry out a development program. The first thing what they need to do is do a pre-formulation studies. Without this, you cannot proceed further. So here, you need to do a pre-formulation study where you see the polymer drug miscibility, polymer drug compatibility. How you can do? You can do by DSE, or you can do it by TGA, or you can do by absorption techniques, mostly for hygroscopicity. And when you do this, you will see whether there is a abolition of the uh, melting peaks of an API, because once the drug gets miscible inside the polymer, the peak goes off. So these are the few pre-formulation studies which you need to do. Extrusion optimization is more of the screw speed, ballot temperature, uh, feed rate has to be understood. So you need to make an optimized, optimized process. And once the process comes out, once the material comes out of the process, the downstream uh, cooling effect is very important because moment you uh, bring the material outside the dye, you need to arrest or you need to cool it because you need to quench the amorphous form which has been converted. So cooling is very, very important. Finally, you have to evaluate the product. So there may be various uh, uh, parameters for evaluation that. So it depends upon the product. And finally, the product characterization in terms of a stability study. So again, in terms of stability, you need to see the uh, stability of the uh, form which has been there. That's the physical nature. 
That's because you are converting into an amorphous form, so it should not convert back to the crystalline form. You need to monitor that. This can be done by DSC or XRD. This is the general flow of what has been there. You mix a material that is API and the polymer or polymers. You do an extrusion. Once you do the extrusion, uh, you get a flake or a pellets. Next step is milling. In past, I have seen a lot of people uh, asking the questions about the milling. Milling is a very, very critical process. So if you are using any cellulosic or elastic polymer, milling becomes very, very difficult. In those cases, Fritz mill becomes one of the right choice because this can cut and break the cellulosic material because these cellulosic material are more of elastic in nature. Alternative, if the, if the polymer is not uh, elastic in nature, it's more of brittle, you can use a conventional mill. And what you get out is a powder. The powder can be mixed with uh, various uh, fine blend or the extra granular material, compressed into a tablet or a capsule. Let us now understand a few case studies uh, and the approach how you make it. Let's see the first case study of uh, a methanemic acid, uh, solubility enhancement of methanemic acid using hot mill extrusion. Uh, this is one of the study which I was a part uh, in Mississippi. So the objective was enhancing the solubility of methanemic acid by using hot mill extrusion, and we used eudigit EPO as a polymer. So the choice of the eudigit EPO polymer was because here we wanted to make a formulation which is going to be like a, a taste mask formulations. So EPO is the right choice over there. Uh, the, the, uh, the property of a, a methanemic acid, it's very poorly uh, water soluble. That, that is practically insoluble. The melting point is 230 degrees centigrade and we have used eutrogid. So eutrogid is a low, uh, uh, low TG polymer. Now here, uh, once you make an extrudate, uh, what we see is uh, the stability also becomes important and we also need to understand till what level of drug loading can be possible. So we did one example here is that we use an FTR analysis method. And what we see from this FTR analysis, as you start increasing the concentration of the drug, that is up to 40% of drug loading, so you would start seeing the CHO bonding coming emerging out. So this is somewhere where you can see, okay, there is not an interaction or uh, the drug is not completely getting stabilized. The hydrogen formation is not been there. So this, this is some few study which you can do in understanding what drug level you can incorporate and whether the drug can be stabilized inside the matrix system because some hydrogen bonding inside the polymer and the drug can even stabilize the drug. Uh, so we carried out the dissolution studies of uh, the extrudates. And what we can see is a 20% of drug loading gives the highest rate and the extent. So why this 20%? Uh, because now here, the matrix system, what has been formed, the uh, EPO can give a very good environment for the drug to get released. And that can even act sometimes act as a co-solvent in this. Uh, we also have analyzed the stability. So once the extrudes have been formed, uh, various drug loadings have been stored at uh, different conditions. Uh, the data shown here is uh, uh, 4075. And what we see is up to three months, there is no crystalline formation of the API. Uh, that's been also uh, cross-verified by XRD. Uh, you don't see any uh, crystalline peak coming out after three months of stability. This slide uh, talks about how you can combine two polymers and can improve the solubility or in, improve the stability. This is one of the examples when you see, uh, let us take the first case where we use methanemic acid and only VS64. Uh, the dissolution was only 10%. And this I'm talking about the dissolution after two hours. So there, may be, there was a rise and a fall uh, of the dissolution because VS64 was not able to hold the drug in the solution form. We made small changes. So we added a surfactant, Lutrol F60. We could see after two hours, there was 50 to 54% of the drug release. So that means 54% was still in the solution form. 
we increased the uh, the concentration of lutron we could see enhancement but interestingly when we combined vs64 with uh, spmc eas of 5% here and a combination of lutron gave more than 80% of the drug release so here the spmc acts as a precipitation inhibitor so this is something very important to understand when you make a formulation so combination of polymers can be helpful for you conclusion is that uh, uh, we were able to make uh, extrudes uh, of uh, mefenimic acid with udg dpo and finally the very important is that we were able to make a stable formulation and hpmc as can act as a precipitation inhibitor the next case study is uh, the effect of uh, carbon dioxide or pressurized carbon dioxide this is something very uh, uh, a different set of a uh, trial or experiment which you have done earlier we have used a pressurized carbon dioxide we don't want to call this as a critical carb uh, super critical carbon dioxide because at the point of injection inside the extruder we didn't knew what is the pressure and what is the temperature and that's why we could call this as a pressurized carbon dioxide so we use ketoprofen as one of the drug and hydroxy propyl cellulose hpc as uh, one of the uh, polymer importantly we use carbon dioxide because this is inexpensive non toxic non flammable very good solvent and uh, co2 can get solubilized and diffused inside the polymer very well here again we, uh, we did the dsc study where we wanted to understand at what level the miscibility of the drug is been there this this dsc is without any carbon dioxide but what we can see uh, up to 60% we were able to have the drug solubility inside or and above there was a crystalline apr still been left so this is one of the way you can characterize like what level you can go uh, in terms of a drug loading but at 60 also there was some peak which you can see at the formation so uh, you need to restrict somewhere because you can load inside the uh, polymer but how it behaves in the solubility and the dissolution is a next character so we we processed the uh, ketoprofen and hpc uh, hpc in an extruder uh, the processing conditions were uh, without carbon dioxide it was 140 degrees uh, when i say 140 because a thumb rule is that you need to process the material 20 to 30 degree higher the glass transition temperature and interestingly what you see when we perform the trials with with co2 we could reduce the barrel temperature from 140 to 120 degrees centigrade so that means there was a reduction of 20 degrees uh, processing condition because carbon dioxide acted as a plasticizer here and the torque value also came down uh, when the extrude comes out we did a cross section and we uh, we just took some images in the microscope on the left hand side what you see with carbon dioxide without carbon dioxide it's a very solid structure with carbon dioxide you are able to see a porous structure when it comes out and the uh, dissolution also is very very high because the formation of a porous structure so this helps in various uh, uh, this has a various advantage because you can mill it very easily cellulosic polymer not easy to mill so it gives a porous structure and the particle size reduction can be easily possible the conclusion here is that uh, pressurized carbon dioxide acts as a plasticizer surface area increases solubility increases and you are able to uh, also uh, have the milling efficiency which is much much better because cellulosic polymers are difficult to mill other case studies uh, where we said yes uh, by hot melt extrusion you can even make a modified release formulations so we have we had used uh, potassium chloride and uh, hydrogenated vegetable oil uh, here what we did importantly is that rather than taking it completely molten we have cooled last few barrels so that you don't get a complete melt because once you melt uh, vegetable oil it's more of a watery consistency but terminal few barrels you cool it so that it comes out as a solid formulation so these and then further milled down and we even tested uh, the uh, release parameters it was able to uh, hold for uh, a good amount of uh, control release been there but optimization is still been required the similar case study is in glomifentrin uh, we did it so uh, here what we see is uh, 
we use rumefentrin and co uh, copoidone as one of the choice but uh, expedates what you see is there was a decline in the uh, uh, solubility over a period of time because the drug was not able to be uh, stable inside the solution so super saturation forms but it comes out but only thing what you could see in comparison to the physical mixture so there is a, the the rate was very very high so we have the next polling question to you uh, vidya yeah. over to you thank you vijay let's see what we have on the third poll question please select your answers from the list of options displayed on your screen which are the application you are looking for using hot melt extrusion solubility enhancement modified release taste masking all of the above so you have about 30 seconds to choose your answer all right 3 2 and 1 let's see the result so 28% say solubility enhancement 3% say modified release 3% say taste masking and 67% say all of the above also if you have any questions on the ongoing webinar please drop into the q&a tab at the bottom of your screens and kindly ask your questions Vijay will answer them at the end of the webinar. Let's now go back to Vijay for the final session of the webinar. Uh, thank you, Vidya. And what I could see is that uh, uh, the scientists want to use hot melt extruder for all the applications. Yes, it has been possible, as we have heard earlier, that hot melt extrusion can be used for all the applications, from the right from solubility enhancement to taste masking and modified release. Now. now you are able to develop a process you did all the lab experiments and you are able to get the desired specifications and the properties of the product but uh, scaling up in the nhme is is as a bit of difficult because it's not a linear process whereas the other equipment there is a, some linearity here the linearity is been not there because of this so this becomes critical and hence whenever you want to go for a scale up we should not consider scale up based on the dependent factors which are scale dependent factors like barrel temperature length of the heating zone screw speed or feed rate instead what you need to understand while scaling up is understand what are the scale up independent factors like surface area of the barrel because when you move from 10 mm or 20 mm to 40 mm so what's the total surface area what is the residence time rather than considering what is the length of the barrels degree of fill because uh, as you uh, are able to run at different conditions so you need to understand the scale up factor in terms of how much is going to be a total degree of fill because you are also going to scale up the feeding rate because increasing the feeding rate whether it is going to change in a degree of fill so you have to maintain the uh, the similar ratio of degree of fill and finally very important is going to be a shear rate that is what is the specific mechanical energy you have used it so specific mechanical energy is the total power required divided by the feed rate so it's going to be the the sme so you need to maintain those scale independent factors rather than considering uh, the scale dependent factors so once you make a study uh, when once you get the formulation done so you need to calculate the scale dependent factors like surface area residence time degree of fill and shear rate so we can conduct a separate session on the scale up because that itself is a, a a very good topic to discuss and you can discuss in length just to give an example how uh, the feed rate affects this is one of one of the point not covering everything you can see the residence time have been affected by the feed rate if i am running this at 5 kg per hour 7.5 kg per hour and 10 kg per hour so what you see there is a decrease in the residence time from 57 seconds to 30 seconds so now you can understand just when you increase the size of the barrel it doesn't mean that you are going to increase the feed rate to an extent where you are uh, having higher residence time so there should be a kind of a correlation which occurs between the the scale what you have developed and the commercial scale what you have 
So we can take this session as a separate webinar on scale of factors. Uh, I can just quickly run around uh, the uh, degree of fill. This is again one of the uh, parameters which you see. And what you see in the middle uh, picture, where we have a lot of kneading sections here, most of the materials get filled here because kneading elements ask the material to stay at the kneading section. So you will see a lot of degree fill here. So these are a few examples where, where you need to understand what would be these uh, uh, scale uh, independent factors. So based on that, you can do a scale up of the process. Uh, let's have a quickly look about what are the different models we offer uh, for hot melt extrusion. So we have a lab model, which is a 10P, which is the smallest uh, extruders what we have. You can process around up to uh, uh, 20 grams minimum batch size, and the output can be around 500 grams per hour. The scale above is Omicron 12P. The minimum batch size is 50 grams, and the output can be up to 2 kg per hour. And both these are a lab model. Uh, we call them as Omicron series. Uh, we have a pilot scale, which is a 20 millimeter size. Uh, this can go up to 30 kg per hour. When I say uh, up to 30 kg, it depends upon the processing conditions, bulk density, and material property. Uh, the minimum batch size can be uh, uh, 500 grams. This is a pilot scale machine, which you can use it for any clinical studies. Uh, the next commercial model is Omega 30P and Omega 40P. This is an Omega series. So output can be up to 75 kg, or it can uh, be on 20 kg per hour based on uh, what is the size of the machine you are used. So 40 mm machine can go up to 120 kg per hour. Uh, steer even can provide a customized extruder based on what is an application required. This is one of the extruder we have made customized where we had five different uh, gravimetric feeder feeding different material. So this was the choice coming from the, uh, the customer based on the application what we had. So we are open for customization of the equipments. Uh, recently, uh, we have come with a hot mid extruder for potent compound. Uh, we are able to see a lot of traction coming to the market uh, for potent compound processing, especially few anti-cancer drugs have been there. So, uh, so what we have done, we have modified the uh, barrel section as well as the chill roll flaker design in the extruder so that they are more water resistant. So the sensors and heaters are going to be more water resistant. So you, inside the isolator, you can spray and clean it up. On the right hand side, what you see is an uh, uh, HME with complete isolator. So this can be uh, able to process OEL4 category polymers and uh, AP, uh, polymers API. Now, uh, why uh, working with STEER? Because STEER has uh, been able to provide from a lab scale up to 60 millimeter dia machines have been possible based on what the output required. So we can provide clamshell models or solid block barrels. Customization of HME is possible. And at STEER, we have a very technical uh, sound knowledge people, uh, more than uh, 20 years of experience people have been there who have processing HME. Uh, they can support the customers if there is any troubleshooting required. We have a large library of screw elements, which can help clients to, de to develop a better process. We can even, pro uh, we can even provide uh, upstream and downstream of different types. So based on the application, what is required. Uh, just a small uh, steer life facility in Bangalore. Steer life is one which provides a solution in terms of processing and even uh, trial support. Uh, we have provided uh, some solution to few customers where we used liquid feeding system and a solid feeding, uh, feeding system together. So you could reduce one of the uh, upstream uh, processing uh, uh, step so that there is a synchronization of liquid and solid coming together. So when I say liquid, it's the surfactant. So you can feed uh, simultaneously together. You don't have to granulate it early uh, before processing of the HME. So you can reduce the step. And we are even supporting customers for scale up because if some customers have developed in the lab scale, we can support them in, in scaling it up. One of the example is we, we uh, supported customers to scale up to more than 100 kg per hour. 
Additionally, uh, so we have also uh, been working on uh, changing the uh, spray dried processing system to hot melt extrusion systems. One of the example is an NRTI and an antifungal drug which we have processed where the API was poorly soluble. The drug has a very sensitivity to temperature, decomposes on melting, uh, and choice of the polymer was only HPMC. So HPMC is a difficult to process material, but we were able to process sensitive API and a polymer using a twin screw technology. Uh, in our lab, we have uh, uh, from 10 mm to 20 mm models been available. And based on the customer need, we can even lease these uh, uh, above models for rental purposes. So where customer can take this uh, HME at their site and can do the development of the product over there. Over to you, uh, Vidya, on the last polling question. All right. Um, thank you, Vijay. Let's see our uh, fourth polling questions. Please select your options from the below uh, mentioned uh, this thing. What supports you? What support you would need from Steer for developing a product using hot melt extrusion? Your options are technical support for troubleshooting, rental lab model for conducting trials, trial support at Steer R&D Center, process development support. No current requirement. You will have about thirty seconds to answer this. All right, three, two, and one. Let's see the results. 19% say technical support for troubleshooting. 4% say rental lab model for conducting trials. 29% say trial support at Steer R&D Center. 15% say process development support. And 32% say no current requirement. Also, if you have any questions on the ongoing webinar, please drop into the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and please ask your questions. Let's now go back to Vijay to continue with the webinar. So thank you, Vidya. Uh, so we are almost at the uh, end of uh, the uh, webinars and these are a few of the clients where we have provided our technology for processing. Uh, interesting, interesting to know is that uh, the, uh, there are various models what we have uh, where we can support customers right from providing the rental machine uh, or even supporting uh, uh, for troubleshooting or customer can come with the material uh, we have a lab here we can run certain trials so that the confidence level of the customers improves uh, thank you very much the participant for uh, patience listening to the webinar and hope this presentation was helpful so this was not the exhaustive presentation but if required uh, i can be approached uh, at any time, and if, if required, we can have a one-on-one -on -one, uh, interaction at your facility also. Based on the uh, COVID situations, uh, I may fly down to your uh, place or your lab, and we can have a one-to-one -one discussions. Thank you, thank you very much. So we would appreciate uh, to go to the question and answer sessions. So over to you, Vidya. Thank you, Vijay. On behalf of Steer Life, we thank all of you for participating in today's webinar. Let's now move on to the Q&A session. Over the next 10 to 15 minutes, which I will answer your questions. So let's see what's the first question. <laughs> 